on the course of the week and we've had quite a few and we've restricted it down to two so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions Matt on based sure. on, on what we got and basically after uh, watching the latest uh, Bet Racing Nation YouTube clip I thought I would chuck in a question this is from uh, David G make a stand five at Google Mail um, could you possibly talk about the on air about trainer form when deciding to back a horse I for one uh, know that trainers are creatures of habit and current form is due to the number one condition before I have a bet. Do you think this is somewhat overlooked by most punters? Yeah, there's a few things there. I mean, it's a real interesting one, you know, trainer form. I'm a firm believer is, I mean, there's a difference between trainers being out of form and being really out of form um, sometimes. I think it get overplayed a little bit. I think sometimes the more sexy trainers, if you like, like the Paul Nichols, the, the, the Nicky Hendersons, they can get over bet quite often. So when they get beat at odds on and they might finish, they might run perfectly good races, finish in second and third, everyone screams they must be out of form. When it actually turns out a bit later on, they probably just um, run there. Let me give races. you a trainer. Uh, William Gray Tricks is sort of mm, not at the very top, but near the top and going there. He's not from 27 in January. Um, he had Cool Harden at the weekend. Do you look at that and go, right, I'm not going to back any of his horses until he has a winner? That kind of, that would be concerning, depending on the, the type of bet I was going to be having. I mean, the, the horse you're talking, Carl Harden, we're going to be covering in one of our races this evening. It's the last thing I look for. It's not the, I think the most important thing with anything is the form. You know, to make a decision whether a horse can actually win the race on form, and then I'll go and have a, a look at the trainer trainer to see when they last had win. I'm not normally too concerned if they've had play stuff. I think it's very important sometimes to, to look at the odds. I mean, some trainers, if they're going off over 10 to 1, you expect them to run slightly down the field. But overall, it's a very good email. It's an interesting point. Uh, to, just to elaborate a little bit on that, are trainers for courses? Because on flat, you see that quite often in as much that you look at stats, trainers at certain courses are better than others. I think uh, Roger Varian went years without getting one at Goodwood, for example. Do you think certain trainers are better at certain courses and maybe the way they train the horses? Flat, you know, people will mention Irvin, who you like uh, for the champion mm -hmm. hurdle each way, but they would say Irvin suited to flat tracks. Yeah, and I think that, you know, on what we've seen so far, that can be seen as a fair comment, but he's only had one go at um, Cheltenham, hasn't he? And um, he was he was really fancy that day. I think it's a fair comment, but I think we should give every horse is entitled to have a bad day. I mean, I mean one of the emails um, he suggests in there that um, horses, of course, um, and trainers are creatures of habit. I think that's absolutely true. You know, you look over the years and uh, trainers target horses as preparation for, for certain races. And then there's a lot of truth in that, not to say that some of the trainers you would want to uh, take the opposite view that they Yeah, might. but it also says why are some trainers streak on a, on a go on a winning streak and then you don't then you don't hear them yeah. again it seems to be I mean like all us in life I mean it's about well-being I mean we can wake up in the morning we can say to each other oh, we don't feel too well today unfortunately horses can't do that and it's not until they've actually been on the track and they've been under racing pressure that they can come back and they might swabble or say they might have a virus in the yard and that's no different to that's for example you know, there's a cold going around your office at work not everyone's going to get the cold yeah. but you know you don't know afterwards and I well, think we've seen already this season Donald McCain shut his yard down for a while there was a big meeting at Haydock didn't Absolutely. even put any massages there uh, John Joe O'Neill was going through a really tough time in December was get, getting the winners now uh, but so you do, when you were assessing a horse how much on a mark would you would you change it I wouldn't. I mean, with with the with my ratings that you know during this show week after week, I will assess it on the performance there. And quite often, and I mean, horses do underperform, but I quite often find that it can be overplayed. And later on in the season, I mean, Cole Holden's one we're going to speak about. I mean, I'm not. I'm not convinced he's run that far under under his form, apart from markedly jumping out to the left. We'll come to him um, in a little bit. But um, I think sometimes it can be used as a bit of an ex you know, it can be overplayed as um, as a little bit excuse. It, it's sure to happen. I'm not saying that it's not, but it is overplayed. Would I then, for example, John Joe Neal, if over that period of time, which he was out of form, there was no, mm. you know, there was no doubt about it. So when I sit down to analyse the race and he's got a horse in there, that I do look at that and think well actually we've got to ignore those runs and probably take some of the better form so 
the most important thing in answer to the question, I completely agree that the first, you know, you've got to make sure that the horse has form to win the race. And sometimes horses have to turn the corner. So, John Joe, there comes a time when a horse is probably on the book should be two to one. That in fact, sometimes you can get four to one because the bookies will take the view of that it's completely be against this horse. But the tide has to change. So I wouldn't be if it was those sort of cramped odds that we're talking about. If we were talking about a horse that I thought was two to one, it was going off tens because everyone wants to oppose. It. That's slightly different, but all in all, I would suggest, um, especially in the, the, the top class races, that usually the horses run somewhere near the mark. Okay. Second email we got here is from a James Gubb. He said, uh, Morning, Matt. You're obviously watching the morning. Uh, <laughs> Love the show yesterday and found it very interesting and fascinating about your own handicap system. I wonder if you could help me, but I would like to set up my own system, but I wouldn't know where to start. I would be grateful if you could give me some hints of how to start it up. Yeah, thanks James for your email. Uh, this will be something that we will be covering um, during not so, so much at the moment because of the obviously the build up to the Chantham Festival, but for sure it will be on one of the perhaps quiet weekends in reflection that I will give everyone a starting point and they're basically the start to how I handicapped um, horses. So, you know, stay tuned every week because we will come to that. And, and also we've mentioned before in terms of the way that you handicap and you're looking more um, at the next run and the run after and the whatever, uh, whatever. They're looking at it from a handicapper's point of view ahead of time. Is that a fair comment? Um, is it fair? In com some cases? In, in some cases. I mean, I must say, you know, I, I take the form exactly how it is. It just happens to be, I don't. I take form how it is, generally, unless I can watch a race and it doesn't make any sense. But if I think for a horse has run its race, I will handicap around it and get a figure. Now, the handicapper won't take that extreme view, because if he did, he'd probably have, he'd probably have hate mail coming from owners and trainers saying, what have you done to my horse? So he has to leave a little bit. I'm sure he agrees. How, how much do you put down to age? Nothing down to age nothing. at all. I wouldn't take that into consideration unless... See, I would. In a, you know, in age situation, yeah. I wouldn't be using a horse who was whose miles were over the clock if I thought he was digressing with his runs. I would use a horse that I think has, you know, is produced. And, and the same way is that a young horse, I might not necessarily a young horse who I think could be progressive. I try and go in the middle and find a horse that I think's probably reached his peak but being consistent to handicap it around. OK. Right, OK. Um, keep those questions in, and right at the end of the programme, we'll, we'll give out those details again. We did have, as I said, far more than two, but we only had time to, to go through two. We are um, going to go through two particular races with a view uh, with Cheltenham in mind. And one of the races that took place at the weekend was the Cleve Hurdle, won by um, Safa Duru. And uh, immediately, um, bookmakers quoted six, or, I think six or seven to one, for the um, uh, World Hurdle itself. So I just wanted to ask Matt A whether that was good value, and B, how he read the race. Yeah, this, I mean, I think it's fair to say everyone, including ourselves, I know we spoke about it before, Peter, was that it, uh, it did have a shape, the world hurdle, at one stage. We thought, well, who's going to win the world hurdle? It didn't look particularly strong. And I've changed my view on that now. I think this form is beginning to make complete sense. Safa Daru was stepping into to great company for the first time, having been a very progressive horse, going for handicaps. Remember, it went, in, it went on to Lanzarote, um, didn't it? So off from marks of 130, had an official mark of 165, going in this race. I've always seen the horse uh, being a horse of 175 and that I gave that horse that mark probably on its run on the Lanzarote so I was well ahead of the handicapper. I think he's the one, the benchmark to go around. I think it's important to notice that the second horse, he was in receipt of four pounds okay. at the trip of Hopefully we'll, we'll get the table up um, on this particular race yeah. and we can take a look at the figures um, for this race. Here we go. So, right. just to explain to everyone at the top, so we've got the type of race that we've got. Uh, we've got a grade two here, class run. It's running over three miles on the new course at Cheltenham. Now, I think it's important to point out there's two courses we've got at Cheltenham. Now, the new course is the stiffer of the two and it's important to remember the actual world hurdle itself will be rang on this new on the new track they've got an old uh, course there that's the likes of the champion hurdle we run so we can expect this is you know the true trip of world hurdle whether we're going to encounter the soft ground of the conditions we've got we don't know so what we've got there is Safa Daru is the winner of odds of a uh, three to one and then we've got his weight next which is 11 stone four with his trainer Paul Nichols and, and the jockey Sam Twiston Davis now now, we've got the BHA rating there. Now, that's the British Horse Racing Authority's official handicap.
Kappa. Going into this race, the horse was allotted a mark of 165. Now, on the right, that's my mark. That's my private handicapper of value rater of 175. Now, that's my mark having won the race. Now, I'm sure the handicapper will adjust that 165, but for me, he's run to a mark of 175. Now, in second is an interesting horse here. Now, this is a horse really to take strong form out. Now, he's carried 11 <coughs> stone 8, as you see there. Now, that's four pounds he's had to give the winner for a neck beating. So, basically, Basically, that puts the second horse, for, if they were to run off level weights, in theory, he should have finished four lengths in front of him. But it works out as a pound a length there for a neck beating that he's got there. Now, it, back in third, we got the went off the favour, eleven stone two. So that already tells you there the fact he, the the David Pipe horse in third was beaten two and a half uh, two and a half lengths in a race of the world hurdle when everyone runs off level weight. He's got an awful lot to find on that. Now one seven five, I'm suggesting for Safford Drew, one seven nine for the second horse. Now what's really interesting is we look at the second horse, Rev de, uh, de Silvia. Is it Rev de Silvia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rev de Savola. Rev de Savola. Now, prior to that run, he actually ran at Ascot in a three-mile race against Arcanda. Now, they off, ran off level weight. So if I'm suggesting that I believe the second horse who, you know, runs his race, doesn't he? I mean, he wears his heart on his sleeve. I mean, yeah. you just felt sorry for the horse, really, second. But what it did do, for me, was give him a mighty Frank and Zarkanda, who really threw the race away when he hit the front too soon yeah. at Ascot and came past. So... On that form, it, I mean, it is grade two level. It does put likes of Rev de Silva. Now, he's 25, what, 25 to 1 for a world hurdle, and he's coming out the same horse as Arcandra. I'm slightly confused to why that is perhaps... Are you basing this a lot around uh, Cool Harden? No, I'm not, actually. I actually based it around Safa de Rue, who I've always had as a 175 horse. Now, it's interesting you mentioned Cool Harden, because... If I'm right about the mark of Safa de Rue of 175, Cole Harden, who's been beaten in the race, 15 and a half lengths, um, actually giving the winner um, four pounds, comes out at 163 on my rating. Now, when I went back to see what rating I'd given Cole Harden for his run behind Rock on Ruby, spookily enough, it was exactly the same, 163, which leads me to believe that my mark of Safa de Rue was right. More interesting to that is if we're talking about Rock on Ruby being a around the 9-1 to one for a world hurdle. For me, now, he can't win. He's got to prove that he's going to step up to the world hurdle mark. Now, if we look at this race here, now, Cole Harden, I say, was beaten 15 and a half lengths by Safa Duru and the second horse, Rev de Silvia. Um, the time before, Cole Harden was two and a half lengths behind Rock on Ruby. If you take that strict line of form and assume, I know it's different distances, but that's an awful, there's an awful lot of discrepancy there in distance. And you can also say as well, I mean, again, this was a step up in trip for the uh, the, the favourite, which was backed on the day on on Temps Port One. Mm. Um, Cole Harden, if you base that, it beat it almost identically to the same distance it beat it last year. Absolutely. Even though, even though it's heavy ground, probably a couple of lengths. Uh, I think it was 16 lengths last year, 13 lengths this time. Yeah. So uh, the form does have... You know, whatever way Make, you look at it. It makes sense. Yeah, it makes it, sense. You know, it makes sense. And it makes... You know, with, with my ratings, I, I'm not, you know, going to say that we say sometimes the ratings are always on because I adjust them all the time but when I actually put a mark in the Safa de Rue and I've worked on the 175 and I go through I come down to Cole Harden and I go back and get the identical mark I mean it can't just be coincidence all the time can it that you get that um, so for me Cole Harden admittedly he jumped out to the left um, markedly at two of his hurdles and I know it was noticed um, after the race from the stewards was taken a note from the British Horse Racing Authority's website that Cole Harden they reported had some breathing problems now you know that may well be true it may be he had those breathing problems before when he ran against rock and rubin and he's run to the he's run to the same mark but i appreciate that the both races rock and ruby was extended two and a half miles and the cole hard and now this was actually three miles but for my years of reading form it's funny you know if horses even extended in distances usually run between the same type of mark you know for the world hurdles point of view, I think this could turn out to be a real key indicator um, to it now. I, and I really do think that on my, in my mind now, the likes of Zarkanda um, for the world hurdle looks really attractive now, especially if they decide at Paul Nichols, and I, I hope they do, decide to take those blinkers off and replace them with cheek pieces. Because I think on that day against Rev de Silvia, 
that he threw the race away. I mean, he was running all over it, wasn't he? Coming down to the last that day. And from the back of the last, he got a little bit lazy. And because he had those blinkers on, of course, the horses, when they wear blinkers, they're restricted. So he didn't actually see the horse until it went past. And then he did fight back. I'd like to see them change to cheap pieces. In summary, I think Safa Daru, who won this race, reminds me of Clestial Halo a little bit. And I think he's just going to fall a little bit short of what's required to win a world hurdle. Now, people will say um, Safa Daru was the first time that it had uh, um, gone this distance hurdle and gone with this class of race. Um, but it was four pounds lighter than Rev, uh, Rev de Savola. So are you saying that it won't reverse the form at Cheltenham? No. I mean, you know, four pounds, the horse clearly, you know, see the closing stage, it was desperate, wasn't it? Absolutely desperate. And he needed that four pounds. You know, if they were off level weights, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that you know, he would have finished around four lengths behind. And well, people that may be watching this and are new to, uh, new to reading for might think, well, you're crawling, but you know, a pound and left, it can't be right all the time. But it's uncanny, you know, um, how much that is. And that's how they work, the and, British and horses. And what, what about the, the, the pie horse there, who carried very low weight, 11 2? Mm was backed on the day, hadn't seen it for some time. Yeah. Has there got room for improvement? Dummy is, he didn't quite get the trip for me. You know, truly got the trip. Um, he's obviously, I think, a drop down in trip. I think he's performed to a mark of 170. Look, that's very high class itself. But for me, didn't truly, truly get the trip. And in reflection of what he showed on Saturday, the fact, as you alluded to, that he received all that weight, on form point of view, he would have to improve that probably about eight and a half pounds. So, in a nutshell, who wins the world hurdle? On this form at the moment is still obviously plenty to look at and um, in the next you know, next few weeks I will be getting close to the time I'll be pinpointing myself a bit more. But at the moment I would urge people to have a look at that Zarkander form um, at Ascot. At the time um, Zar Bussin was in third that day, 22 lengths back, he was a grade winner. A lot was made of that horse not running its race. I now believe perhaps it did indeed. Okay, right.